Some things are equal and some things are not. Welcome to the March 28, 2023 City Council and School Board Joint Work Session. I am so glad we could be together this afternoon to discuss one of the most important topics in Lynchburg today, education. On our agenda, we have two very important topics to discuss. First, the Deputy Superintendent will provide us with a presentation on the Lynchburg City School Facility Needs Study, followed by the Lynchburg City Schools Fiscal Year 2024 budget presentation provided by the Superintendent. To help us move forward expeditiously through this process, after each presentation, by raise of hand or acknowledgement, I will recognize you if you have any questions or comments for staff. In advance of this afternoon's meetings, I requested questions be sent to myself and Dr. Coleman, and thus far we have received none. Before we begin, I'd like to first offer the floor to School Board Chair Dr. James Coleman to deliver welcoming remarks. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and for the excellent leadership you and your colleagues on the governing body we know to be the Lynchburg City Council. Thank you for all of your great work and for being mindful of public education. I can think of no greater time for us to work together as two governing bodies and now to make sure that the children of Lynchburg receive the best quality education possible. And we're looking forward to a rich, robust, and honest conversation tonight. Thank you very much, Dr. Coleman. Uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Wodica to provide us with an update on the LCS Facilities Master Plan. Good afternoon, uh, Mayor Reed and uh, members of council and, and school board as well. Uh, it's so nice to see everyone and to be with you as it always is. Um, as so as we do, uh, our city and our school staff work so well together uh, that Kent White is going to get us started uh, on this presentation. So. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Wodica. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Kent White. I am the Director of Community Development for the City of Lynchburg, and I'm also fortunate to work with both Lynchburg City School staff and City of Lynchburg staff to pull together data for that, to that will inform your recommendation ultimately on your City Schools Master Plan. But today, my job's pretty simple, which is to bring us up to current, and then my colleague Dr. Wodica is going to step in and talk about what the next steps are in our process. So with that, um, uh, many of you remember last May, just short of a year ago, um, a local architectural firm, uh, Dominion 7 Architects, did an assessment of all our existing school buildings throughout the, and facilities throughout the area. Um, they, uh, their work was exemplary. They were super familiar with a, a number of our schools through work they had done previously. And that study really explained what a lot of us knew, which is that the classroom, from a classroom capacity standpoint, we have more seats than students. So that capacity exists in our existing buildings. Um, however, the age of our schools, and they gave us kind of the average up there, um, the age of our schools, especially our elementary schools, which has our youngest residents, if you will, um, are um, not uh, to a place where they meet our current programming needs. And many of you have seen firsthand as you're walking through the schools how our faculty, um, in some cases, shoehorn and relocate all of the programs around that building to make sure that our students get the, the best quality for, uh, um, or the best benefit from this. Um, in addition, the condition of our school buildings, again, mainly our elementary schools, rated as a C minus or a D. And this is primarily due to age of the building, but it also it takes into account system condition, so your building envelope, your mechanical, electrical, plumbing systems, the maintenance needs associated with the buildings, and uh, the, for at least some of the schools, the amount of time since there's been a significant renovation. The assessment presentation suggested building on the work with an educational consultant to help formulate recommendations for programming, the renovation construction, and also the consolidation of these facilities. So if you fast forward to your joint meeting in October of 2022, <coughs> Um, when you reconvened, we were in the process of pulling together proposals for this educational consultant. The RFP was, was structured around the process that's outlined here, with the consultant considering set planning criteria 
primarily in the middle there, to create a, f a framework that would ultimately become your master plan. And here are the planning considerations from that meeting. Uh, in addition to the facility ass assessments that we saw in May. Um, obviously, there are things like instructional programming and the needs that are current and future for our schools, community input, financial capacity, equity among learners, community and neighborhood needs. We know these buildings and facilities are our key points in a number of our, our existing neighborhoods, and the overall efficiency of our operations and buildings. So we also outlined how these criteria would feed into the decision-making process. And the idea is that you would, the consultant would ultimately develop scenarios or alternatives, if you will. It would be buttressed on both ends by community engagement, community in input before, community engagement after, as they prepare those um, alternatives. They would then come back to you for the ultimate adoption of a framework. Again, this is your plan. And then once that framework, once we are set on a course, then we can build in the details, things like CIP planning and um, uh, assess or attendance zones around the meat of that proposal. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Wodica to talk about where we are currently. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ken. And um, you know, I know we've said it before and it it, uh, it goes without saying, but I think it's valuable to say it as many times as we can. We are so thankful uh, for the incredible working relationship between the city and the school staff. Uh, many, many cities and counties don't have that, uh, that benefit, and so we're thankful for that, and, and we really, I really appreciate Kent and all the city staff that are here uh, that's, that help support um, everything that we do. Um, so the next couple of slides, I just want to talk a little bit about uh, scope and timeline. Um, so you will recall that at the October meeting, we discussed the development um, of an RFP for a, a consultant to help us with our educational master plan. So we had a good conversation about what are the condition of our buildings, where are they, are they in the right places, those sorts of things. Uh, the next conversation is really about what are we doing in those buildings and are the buildings that we have appropriate for the educational programming that we need to have um, every single day for our students. Um, and, you know, certainly within reason of what's uh, financially ex um, uh, reasonable for our community to, to support. Um, so as we've had this conversation over the last several months, we've been very focused on developing a thoughtful, um, a methodical, and an intentional, um, and a mindful approach to make sure that this process is focused right where it needs to be, uh, and that is kids in our community. So children who will ultimately be the leaders and adults in our community for the long run, um, and certainly will be critical to the well-being of the success of our community uh, for, the, for a very long time. So in the words of my, my very good friend Sam Coleman, I just want to remind everybody, this is marathon work. Uh, we are all, we should be always thinking about this, um, and certainly we will ultimately end this process with a master plan, but, but we have to recognize that we will be working for many years to implement this plan um, as we develop a strong vision for our community as we go forth. So on your table, I handed this out right before we all sat down, um, is a uh, description of the scope of work. Um, I'm not gonna read it to you, uh, but you see a slide with the sort of the, the gen general uh, time frame of the project, which is about, uh, about six months. We'll probably be closer to six and a half or seven months at this point. Um, but in that, and I, again, I'm not gonna read it to you, but there are uh, seven major tasks which start out uh, with an, what we call an environmental scan. That, that is where we take a look at the data uh, of the school division. This is a very quantitative approach, um, as well as developing an understand of, understanding of how we do business. What does our instructional program look like? Um, what does everything uh, from a data perspective look like for our school division? And that's sort of the first step to get a good idea from a uh, sort of 30,000 foot view, um, as well as sort of an outside view of what's going on in the school division. Now obviously that doesn't uh, tell all of the story, right? There's a lot more to our school division than simply our SOL scores, uh, simply the way that we design lesson plans and, and many, many other considerations uh, that I'll show you in the next slide. So we, uh, the next step in the process is that the consultant will be here uh, starting first next week with you all uh, between uh, April 4th through 6th, um, mostly meeting with city council members and school board members first, as well as some of the senior leaders in the school division, um, as well as visiting a number of schools and a number of other stakeholders um, for the next uh, couple of weeks. So that is sort of the next step. Um, I'm gonna make sure I'm, there we go. Um, 
So the next, uh, the component that we've been working on is this environmental scan. And again, I'm not going to read these to you, but this is the kind of information that the consultant is working through right now. We're looking at enrollment trends. So we've heard uh, over and over again our conversation about uh, a lower enrollment than there once was. Um, so we need to understand what those trends look like. They need to understand that. Uh, and developing a good idea of what uh, is looking, uh, what our what our community is looking like, as well as getting a good understanding of where our students live in the city, um, so they're not obviously equally dispersed, and so that really drives a lot of the conversation about where our schools should be uh, in the long run. So again, not going to read these all to you, but this is the general idea of uh, kind of where we're analyzing, as well as looking at achievement data, looking at the the pros and cons, uh, um, you know, really addressing issues where we do have them, uh, and celebrating the successes um, as well. So once that um, environmental scan uh, is complete, uh, as I mentioned, we'll be in community engagement. Um, and then the next component will be about a month later, so the first week of May. Uh, the consultant will be back uh, meeting with, number one, uh, community groups uh, that we've identified, community stakeholder groups, um, and as well as conducting community meetings. We'll do three in the city, three evenings, uh, one in each school board district over the next uh, couple of weeks. Once that's done, the consultant will go back. We'll figure out all the information they need from the environmental scan, uh, as well as all the feedback that they received from the community about what they see as the vision for the future of uh, public education in Lynchburg. And we'll craft forward for you to consider uh, three to five, and potentially even more, but probably three to five draft scenarios for what our buildings look like um, in the long run. Right. So this is sort of where the rubber meets the road. This is, the, this is kind of the big thing we've been talking about for a while. And you know, we've talked about all options are on the table, right? So we may look at uh, potentially consolidating. We may look at, we certainly will look at uh, attendance zone boundary adjustments. These are these things. And so we're hoping that will sort of occur sort of mid to, first part of mid to, to mid-June uh, so that we'll be able to publicize that information. We'll gather community feedback uh, for you. And then we hopefully will be back uh, with you at a, attentively on, on a joint meeting on August 8th to, uh, for this group uh, to start and uh, discuss what's your path forward, uh, because there will be, at that time, uh, a number of options on the table as well as community feedback. Once City Council and the School Board adopts that plan, uh, then uh, we'll develop that, that more formal implementation plan for how that's all going to work. So um, that's a rough overview of where we are. Uh, we uh, have a lot going on, and you'll be having lots of conversations about this very, very important topic uh, in the coming months. Uh, we look forward to having those conversations. If you have any questions, we'll take them. Thank you, Dr. Wodica. Any questions? Dr. Wodica, you indicated that, that there were some community stakeholders that were identified that are going to be, that they're going to be talked to by, by, by this group. Do you know some of the names of those organizations There's or so, entities? So off the top of my head, we've talked about uh, the NAACP of Lynchburg, uh, the Business Alliance, uh, certainly our economic development uh, leaders. Uh, business leaders in the community. Um, I can provide you a, a more complete list. And I'd also say if you have any thoughts on who we should talk to as far as community stakeholders, uh, please tell us that. We can certainly add them in um, either when they're here or we can, you know, fortunately we can do Zoom too. We can talk to folks uh, pretty easily as well. So in, anybody you feel like we need to talk to, uh, please, we're happy to have those conversations. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Dr. Day? Um, how long into the future are the MGT people thinking about? Is it five years, 10 years, 20 years? What are their mindset about that? Yeah, so, so I think we're probably looking at a five-year uh, window at this point. Um, so those of you who worked together before know I'm, I'm always trying to think about a little bit further out. So I'm, I'm going to kind of push us for a little bit further perspective on, on what the division looks like a little bit longer. Uh, but that's I think five years is going to be uh, their kind of planning time frame. Any other questions? Have a few questions. Okay, thank you very much. Oh, wait, hold on. Um, I'm sorry, I was trying to write a note. Um, Dr. Wardica, thank you for your presentation. Uh, maybe I'm jumping the gun here. Where is redistricting potentially within this discussion, it's, if it's at all? It's a great question. So uh, we see redistricting uh, occurring as a component of the implementation plan. So when we think about what schools will be online, um, after this, this study, right? Uh, you can't really redistrict until you know which buildings those are going to be. And I don't, I don't know what they're going to be. You know, if we think about, uh, you know, consolidating schools and then a building might not be there, so you wouldn't be able to redistrict uh, your, your school until the, the city council and school board adopts a framework 
um, that says this, 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 and this school will be here. So uh, I see logic with it. Wouldn't you, to use a business perspective, wouldn't you take where the need is and then put people, uh, then put the, the service or the whatever maybe in that area? Um, my mindset says, well, if we know where we're a busing most kids to, or we're, there's a need for specifically keeping or putting an elementary school in this area, we then target that area to put a service in. Why, why would we wait? Why would we determine where we're going to put the building and then send people there anyway? Well, so that's a huge part of that data that we talked about, um, mentioned there, that anonymized list of where every student lives and now, now and for the previous four years before that. So we know, um, you know, we have, uh, as, as Kent said, we have more seats than we, when we have kids. So, you know, the conversation about would there be a new school, I don't know if that's going to be a reasonable expectation. We'll, we'll see where that goes forward. But I think you have a number of existing assets uh, that exist right now. Uh, it may be that we think about a new site, but more than likely we're talking about existing sites. And so we take that into account and say, where are the existing buildings now uh, in comparison to where our students are now? And we try to fit it together as best we possibly can. And I think that's probably the most you know, financially responsible uh, way to go about that, rather than sort of uh, wiping the slate clean and saying, well, let's just start it. What, what would this look like if we started over, which is probably not feasible in the long run? Thank you. What would the plan be, and again, if I'm jumping the gun, forgive me, what would the plan be for old or no longer needed buildings? Is that incorporated into this whole discussion? That'll be a part of your scenarios. Um, so we do rent some space as well. So I think we, sh we, we will have a conversation about whether or not it's appropriate to rent that space or reutilize another building, um, or there might be another city purpose um, that, that might, might come forward. I, I don't know that, uh, but certainly um, you know, we, we need to think about all of those things. Um, and I think that'll be a part of the, I know that will be part of the three to five scenarios that, that come about. I'd be curious to know within this plan if there might be an effort to contact families who left, left Lynchburg City Schools to determine what those reasons are, and then if in that new building, build out, remodel, whatever it may be, if that's a component that maybe we might be able to hit, is that data being sought and what that data might be able to offer us as far as uh, no, that's, that's looking we forward? Have, you know, we haven't considered that, but that's certainly a great, great question. Um, when we do the, um, the, the feedback, the community feedback in May, uh, there is there's an online component. I, I don't think I mentioned that. There is a, you know, th of course, the three community sessions as well as the community stakeholders, but there's also a, an online survey component. So it, it could be possible that we reach out to those folks directly and say, hey, here's at least a, an electronic version um, of an opportunity to give feedback. Thank you. Yeah. Dr. Day? Just another aspect of that is the uh, 1971 desegregation mm -hmm. order. Mm -hmm. So how do we coordinate the design of attendance zones um, with that uh, as constraints, how does that work? That's a, that's a complicated question, um, and will be one based on when we figure out what those that portfolio of schools look like. Um, there's also the work being done on the unified status uh, that Dr. Edwards you know, has, has talked to you about quite a bit. So there's a lot, particularly in that that question. Um, there's a lot up in the air that will have to be decided. Uh, but it's, it is a it is a immensely complex uh, comp conversation. Uh, but not one that we are shying away from and one that we are attacking um, as best we possibly can and, and we will have a good plan for it. Thank you. Mr. Hogan. Um, Reed, the, you know, I see here that we're seeing yet another six months on more planning. <clears throat> I look back, we met last time here about six months ago. Before that, we had a committee that was set up for about three years. We've talked with the superintendent and, and others about consolidation because those numbers have dec the declining enrollment with the same number of buildings without any action. And now we see yet again, we're still in the planning, we're still talking. Meanwhile, there's been three years of underutilized buildings, which have a huge cost to our taxpayers when you have the administrative overhead, the upkeep, when you have school buildings, elementary especially, that have, you know, 160 kids in them, without any level of consolidation. Now we're talking, again, good that we're here, but we're talking about saying, okay, we're going to still talk and we're going to still plan, 
but no action. This has been, you know, some of you haven't been here a while, some of you have been here a long time. I mean, this has been going on for three to four years, just in the ability to actually begin consolidation. Sure. So it's now saying, okay, we're not gonna hear from yet another consultant um, in six months or in August 8th of 2023. And then at that time, they'll have a report. And then what will happen at that time, then we'll talk, then we'll get together, and then we'll have another six months, and then we'll have another fiscal year that goes by. Meanwhile, several places across the Commonwealth, they look and they look at their attendance zones, they recognize they do a comprehensive plan all the time. They update it with their, regarding their school and, and educational uh, programs and say, hey, we have a declining enrollment, let's make changes quickly. Th these are going on and on, and, and I probably don't see actually any action with this, with all the consultants that are being hired and all the uh, things that are happening for another, probably another year or two. Meanwhile, that's every year, the budget's coming along. You have duplication of services, you have extra uh, principals, extra vice principals, and meanwhile, our taxpayers are suffering. So, so I, I appreciate that. Um, it's just one thing I, I just want to uh, share for the group and just kind of repeat from the beginning of, of what we, when we talked um, was, was a couple of words that uh, thoughtful, um, intentional, methodical, and, and mindful of the impacts of the decisions that we make. Um, so certainly we know this has been a long process. Uh, we talked a lot about um, how this process was going to work when we talked uh, a few months ago, um, and that's what we're doing. Um, but I do you know, strongly believe in the cues that we're taking are ones from uh, where we're, we're looking for um, a way to make sure that our plan is sound and we understand the consequences of the decisions that we make as a community and the importance of that. So I, the, the point is, is taken, um, and, I, and I appreciate that, uh, but we are moving with intention at this point. And I asked, as <coughs> School Board Member Dave just asked about the, the desegregation, which I asked that uh, question about six months ago. Do we have an answer yet, or is that another six months for the answer for that? Right, so, so I think I answered the question before. So we're working through the unitary status right now, which is a complicated, a very complicated legal issue, um, as well as understanding that there is a, uh, a, an impact based on the decisions you make on what schools you want to have, right? So, so that your, your attendance zones will be based on you know, where the schools are, which schools are appropriate, where the kids live. And, and I, I don't have an answer to that as far as how that will work now. But of course, that would not be a decision we make until we know what that portfolio of school looks like. Uh, thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. And uh, I have enjoyed a wonderful relationship with Mr. Heggleson across the years, at least in my mind I have. Uh, but <coughs> tonight, I, I, I've heard uh, the councilman use the word decline. That's one of his uh, favorite words to use that word decline. I want us to also in the discussion tonight continue to think about the decline and dysfunction in our community and to recognize that the schools and the school board are working diligently with the greatest amount of investment of time that the deputy just indicated. And I hope that tonight's discussion will not just be a continuation of previous discussions about decline in school enrollment and an equal discussion around what is needed to decrease that decline and decay in certain matters of our community. There's a rally tonight there are serious challenges that require more than rhetoric to solve. Mr. Baldy? Forgive my ignorance. Can you remind us, and especially those uh, who are new, and then apparently myself who forgets, unitary status? Can you, can you remind us what that is again? Oh, okay, so I'm going to do my best, and then uh, Dr. I, I'm sure it's uh, please fill in. Yeah, uh, so in oh, let me just take that one. Um, to declare, so in 1971, we were placed under a desegregation order because we were not desegregating the schools in the appropriate manner that we should have, and we were going to take about 13 years to desegregate our schools. So we were forced to do that by a deseg order, which is still in place. In order to have the order lifted, you have to prove something called the green factors, which there are six factors that look at the balance in, of students in your school. So they look at demographics. They look at the demographics of the staff in your school. They look at things as opportunities, programming, access. 
So one of the reasons why we are waiting um, for the consultant work with the desegregation work is whatever the board and the city council decide as this is the future direction of Lynchburg City Schools, you overlay that with are there opportunities, equity for all students? How would the impact of closing this school or this area, and then what would zoning look like or rezoning look like so that we would meet those green factors and not you know, further desegregate or further segregate populations, programming, and schools. So they look at everything, both programming and physical. So we've had a consultant come in and do some work with us to see if we were even, if we've made enough progress to even get to the point where you would petition the court for, deseg uh, for unitary status, which means that desegregation order would be lifted. And as of right now, we have made enough progress. What we didn't want to do is put the cart before the horse and say, hey, let's do this. And folks say, well, what does that mean for what we're going to do in the future with our students in terms of buildings, in terms of programming? We wanted the programming piece recommendations to come first, and then we will add that to the, the work that we've done on unitary status so far. The other thing, just to backtrack, I think as a group, both city and uh, school board, we sort of made a commitment to this community when we went out for an RFP um, that we would hire a consultant and that we would let the consultant guide us through this work. So while I do see where there could be some cost savings if the school just decided, well, we're going to go ahead and do X, Y, Z and close this school and move that school or do this or consolidate in the upcoming fall, I do want to honor our commitment to the community where we said we were going to have a collaborative process, we would have an outside um, consultant work with us. We had the first part done with Dominion 7 who did the facilities part and now we're having the second part done with the um, with MGT as the, as the consultant for programming. So while I understand that we must also act, act expeditiously, I do want to say we should be thoughtful, mindful, and also honor what we have promised um, this community in terms of the work that we have already done. So to clarify then, based on the data you're looking for, in addition to, with, in addition in conjunction with the feds, the location or what may or may not be needed is going to be driven by those factors in addition to budgetary and calls for service, to use a public safety term, if you will. Not quite that. What I'm saying is we've already, in the work that we've done with looking at unitary status, the progress that we have made in terms of programming, adding more gifted programs, more AP programs, we've met those green factors. But as we look forward to consolidating schools or building a new school or adding a program or expanding pre-K or adding gifted programs, one of the things that we want to do, at least for our community, is talk through, well, what does that look like through all of those lenses if we look at those green factors as well? We know we meet them now, but what would it look like if we did X, Y, Z with schools? How do we fare? And in order to do that, I kind of need to know what is the proposal for X, Y, Z going forward. And then we can move forward with if this school board and if this um, council wants to go ahead and declare you know, or petition for a unitary status, we can do that. I think it's important for people, community, families, to know what does it look like? What does the future of education look like? What is actually on the table? What, what are we getting? What does consolidation look like? What does new school look like? What does rezoning look like? What does programming look like? What are we doing for pre-K? What are we doing for gifted education? How are we expanding CTE? I think folks would like to know those answers before we just say, by the way, let's take school X offline. I do have a follow-up, but it's not on necessarily on this topic, so if others have questions, I'd be happy to. Dr. Yeah. Wilder. Great. Thank you again for the presentation. It's greatly appreciated. You know, as we look over the past couple of years, dealing with COVID and so many other issues, that kind of took us off track for a minute. Um, so we're back on track. I'm glad for the plan we have that we continue to address those issues of our schools. And thank you for having so many persons engaged in the conversation. You know, we were at a business meeting at of CBCC the other day, and one of the things they mentioned about certain programs might be needed, whether it be welding you know, or certain other things, what does our business community really need for this particular area? So as we look at reshaping our schools or our school buildings, 
considering what the business leaders are saying, so our kids are prepared for that work world. We have a high poverty rate, which is the highest in the area, like 21% or whatever, it's gone down some, but we do have a high poverty rate, and making sure our kids are employed in, mm -hmm. in jobs that give them a living wage. So make sure our schools are meeting that need of our businesses, mm -hmm. as well as addressing the poverty issues in our community. So I thank you for engaging all stakeholders in our community, from, from One Voice One Community <laughs> to NWCP to so many other organizations, that we're including all the stakeholders um, in that conversation as we move our schools forward, because it's about our children, it's about our schools, it's about what's best for the children that we serve. Thank you. And if, if I could just add to that, and I, I don't know, um, we have not had a conversation in a joint group, but I might as well do that right now. We are very proud of the work that we are doing with community, and you all should know that this area received um, not one, but two lab school planning grants for this area. And I'm proud to say that I was collaborating on both of those. Our team was very um, vested in working directly with the University of Lynchburg, which got the elementary lab school grant, and with CVCC and the CTE Academy to expand that CTE Academy. And our fingerprints, are, our, our conversations are right in line with that. We were very supportive of that. We were working lockstep with both of those universities and excited to do the work so that we can do exactly what you want. I mean, everybody at this table, at least I hope, everybody at this table believes that all children can achieve, that all children deserve the best opportunities to achieve, and that collectively, each and every one of us at this table are responsible responsible, responsible for making sure that we put adequate resources in our schools, in our community, so our children can not just survive and get a high school diploma, but so that they can thrive and live well and give back to this community. That is our charge as a dual governing body, schools and city, when it comes to our children, and that is what we are working together with. And to the degree w which we partner with the community and we partner with local businesses and nonprofits and our local colleges, that is wonderful because that is only going to help the economy in our city if our children are also <coughs> thriving when we do that work. Dr. Gupta? <coughs> you know, Dr. Edwards, we were under the scanner of Office of Civil Rights for a while. They are off our backs now. So if you start making these decisions to close schools, redistrict, and while making morning coffee, do you think by lunchtime they'll be on your door again? <laughs> no, I think we're going to be very thoughtful about the decisions that we're making because we're trying to be purposeful in ensuring that all children have access, opportunity, um, and availability for whether it's the facilities that they go to school in, whether it's the playgrounds that they play on, whether it's the programming that's in that school or those schools, um, we, we're not going to have them back on our doorstep, not under my watch. The process you're following keeps you in compliance to keep OCR off your back. Yes. If short of that, you risk having federal agencies again back on City of Lynchburg and Lynchburg City School. And we certainly do not want that, no. Exactly. I actually have a question, Dr. Modica. Um, so I, from what I understand, you know, one of the issues has been, or concerns has been, uh, the numbers, uh, the attendance numbers at some of the schools, pri primarily the elementary schools. And uh, Mr. Taylor and I have had the pleasure of going around and in touring some of the elementary schools. We've actually had a really good time doing it. I'm so thankful we have. Thank you for the tours, by the way. Thanks for doing it. And um, so, you know, we, I have four sons, and they've been in public schools their whole lives, and we've lived all over the country and actually the world. Um, and and. I've had the experience of having sons that have been in classrooms with as many as 27 kids at elementary school level, a lot of kids. Um, and when we toured one of the schools recently, there was a um, classroom with like 13 kids to one teacher. And I was like, I was so thankful for that actually. I think we talked about the blessing of a lower student teacher ratio, specifically at the K through five level in my experience is is ideal to have 13 or 15 students to teachers at that at that age range just because of the attention that's needed specifically if you don't have like a teacher's aide or a um, an assistant of some sort 
And so I'm wondering, um, I think you told me that the max number of students allowed in a classroom at that level is 26, 27, is that correct? It depends on the, on the grade, it depends on the school based on a number of factors, but it's 20s. Yeah. Okay, so, so some of the conversations that we had were about um, some of the barriers that some of the students in our city face. And I was wondering, are the consultants considering that? So a couple things, it's a kind of a multi-tiered question. While maybe there is a max capacity allowed for students in the classroom, are they weighing what's the best um, number that's um, for success rates for students? Are they weighing the issues that students today are facing with increases in mental health issues and um, behavioral uh, problems on the rise? Are they weighing specifically the issues that students in our city deal with in making decisions for what a, a fair classroom size would look like before assuming that we should consolidate? Are these things and factors that these consultants are looking at? Yeah, absolutely. So, so, so first of all, thank you, thank you for that, and and thank you for for coming to visit. We we really really enjoyed that. Um, the first thing I'll just say in that is that we we believe and we know that that all students can learn. Um, that um, all students can they certainly bring different backgrounds and experiences, um, and all students um, and sometimes need different supports in different ways uh, f based on their particular need. That's why our, our 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 slogan is every child by name and by need to graduation and beyond. Um, certainly, smaller class sizes are often uh, better, right? And, and, and if we had that for every single classroom, that would be wonderful. Uh, we know that there's budgetary constraints and resource constraints that that um, is not always possible. Uh, but certainly, uh, recognizing the unique experiences and the unique, unique needs of our students, that's why we have such a robust um, you know, data collection uh, process to, to really literally look at you know, every single child and, and understand how that connects to uh, neighborhood characteristics and experiences. Um, a, a couple years ago, we did a lot of work at the city um, looking at different neighborhood impacts where there's uh, different, different phenomena going on, right? So, so violence and crime and those sorts of things and, and bringing that into the table and understanding um, the experiences that many, many of our children have. And so absolutely, that's part of that environmental scan. That will also be a huge part of the conversations I hope that you have uh, with with the consultant and that and members of our, of our community have with our consultant because again we, we do I mean fully believe that every child uh, can learn has a gift um, sometimes might need different supports than, than other kids and that's okay and mm -hmm. we are, are have a responsibility as Dr. Edwards said to meet those needs uh, where we possibly can okay let me correct myself before I get attacked on social media our youngest child is in a private school he started in eighth uh, in eighth grade after COVID because he needed to be in person learning however Bottom line is, I paid attention to classroom size, and I did just wanted to make sure that that was um, something that was considered in in the consolidation aspect of looking at you know the needs specifically of our city. So thank you very much. Anyone else? Well, oh, Dr. Day. Go ahead. Oh, Dr. Carthy. Go ahead. Just going back to regarding the z desegregation, just for more ex explanation, because I know that when I first heard about that, going to a conference that it appears to be a little scary at first because you're thinking, oh my day, all of this work that people have done, now we're gonna take that away. And Dr. I was, if you, I don't wanna put you on the spot, but if you want to just give a little more explanation regarding that and why we are looking at the green factors and all. Yeah, if, if you take a look at our, which I wish I had here, our bus maps and just how we transport kids across the city, you may ask questions like, well, why does that community drive past elementary school A and B and have to go to elementary school C when they should be here. Um, and then if you come downtown, you could live on one side of the street and your neighbors across the street go to one school, a different school. A lot of that was done in response to the DSEG order, um, as were some other creative strategies as to offering volunteer programs where families could sign up and be considered for schools of innovation, come down to the GO Center, those types of things to balance out our schools. As we look at programming and as we look at offerings and as we look at the placement of things, and even when you just you look at our pre-K program um, as well as where that is placed, we do want to look at where our students are versus how much time do they spend on the bus to get there. And is that the best use, best time 
for kids and, and what does that mean when they're going to school? What does that mean when they're coming home from school? There is a fear that if you declare unitary status that that gives you somehow permission now to go back to segregation. It's, ab it's absolutely the opposite. It gives you permission to now do some programming where you're really looking deep as to what are we offering and who's participating. Who has the opportunity to participate? And you ask those tough questions of why. And the work that they did with us, there's a consultant that comes along with DSEG. They did everything from looking at our yearbooks and looking at our clubs and our activities. What kids are participating and why? Why are these kids here? Why are these kids there? Why is the enrollment in this program? Um, similar to when we had the OCR looking at our AP programs, we've done a great job of increasing the number of AP offerings and the students who are taking that, taking AP and advanced and honors classes. But that's something else that they look at and they look at that across the two high schools and look at advanced um, coursework throughout the middle school. So as we look at programming, as we look at the work that we're doing, we're combining with our lab schools, our schools of innovation and just the future of um, Lynchburg City Schools, having unitary status allows us to do some things that we were we were called to do um, the way our busing is, we can change that and provide students with some excellent services in multiple buildings. And we, we're not held to something in 2023, 2024 that was decided in 1971. Anyone else? Okay, well if we're finished here, thank you so much gentlemen, we appreciate your presentation. And we will move on to the LCS fiscal year 2024 budget proposal. Dr. Edwards. Switching seats for you here. <coughs> okay. Yeah, All right. So before I get started, I'd just like to first thank you for the opportunity to be here and talk about our schools and talk about the great things that our kids are doing. Um, and speaking of great things that our kids are doing, I just want to highlight one of our great kids who uh, reached out to me and said, hey, I'm interested in superintendency. What do you do? Can I shadow you? And I said, absolutely. So they've come to everything from a policy meeting to an operations team meeting um, and several different things at the admin building. And that student, who happens to be Mr. George White, who is the superintendent for today, is here tonight to look at this process. So we never deny an opportunity for our students to learn from us. And as I always say, there are more classrooms than what are in our buildings. The entire world is a classroom, including this meeting here tonight. So uh, George, would you please just give me a evaluation at the end of this, how well I do as superintendent. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so tonight we're talking about our proposed budget. You see here, although I'll be the person speaking, on behalf of it, I am certainly not the person who did the work solely by myself. I have a wonderful team in directors and support staff over here, as well as depth in the back there. I have some of my building principals here and some of my other team members here who are very much connected to the work that we do with the budget. Um, first and foremost, here's a little bit about us, uh, what we have in terms of programmings. We do have an early learning center, as well as uh, 11 elementary schools, which is the topic of conversation for our facility study. Um, some alternative programs, as well as a virtual academy, which is still thriving even after um, the pandemic has uh, subsided somewhat, and some specialty programs. And you can see, uh, we kind of broke down our staff a little bit by um, positions of school-based employees, transportation, um, information technology and maintenance. I often have a slide that says we are like a mid, uh, mini city um, because we have various departments similar to the city. We have a social working department. We have school nutrition department. We have transportation. We have maintenance and grounds and fields that we take care of. So very similar. But about 90% of our staff provide um, direct support to our kiddos. I'm gonna cross that out because I always get this comment about what are you doing with regard to those facilities? And I'm gonna go back to my commitment to the community that says, you know, we did a lot of work last year on just the brick and mortar 
and that's part of what we do is education. We provide brick and mortar. But the big part of what we do is provide programming, and that's the stage that we're on right now. So we will be moving forward with our recommendations. And as I said at our community conversations, we did about five of them last spring with families. It could be new construction, consolidation, rezoning, closure, renovation. All of those things are on the table. And each one of those, depending upon the parent, the family member, has an emotional connection to it. And we, as a governing body and a group, when we get to making those decisions, we'll be dealing with folks who they're all for closure, just not my school, or they're all for rezoning, just not my block, or they're all for new construction, as long as that my kid is going into that new construction. So we'll have a lot more to talk about come summer. A Little bit about our demographics. Um, we are a public school. We don't get to pick who comes to us. We open our arms and take every child that comes to our doorstep. Um, and this is what our population looks like. About 63% of our population is economically disadvantaged. That's no shock to this community because we know that poverty, poverty is a big thing in this community and this community has done a lot to eliminate, attack, reduce poverty and working together. But we continue to do that. But these are the kids that are in our schools um, that come to us. Here's what we look like compared to what the city looks like. And I always like to take a pause on this because we have to realize that we as the adults, the governing body, are making decisions for the little people who are sitting in our schools. And look at the little people. Sometimes the little people don't look like us. But we still are responsible for making the best decisions for those little people that, that come to us. Um, and this is what our demographics looks like. And it has changed quite a bit over, over the five years that I have been here. Our core beliefs. This is really, really important to us. We changed our mission statement this year. Actually, we always had it informally, but we formalized by saying every child by name and by need to graduation. But graduation is a low bar. And for us, it's not just can we put a diploma in somebody's hand, have them walk across the stage, do a happy dance, and then we're done. It really is about and beyond. So if we're not helping with life-ready kids, kids who can thrive, kids who can have their own families and survive, kids who can make a difference and give back to their community, that's part of our mission. So that's part of the work that we do. We do that work with students. We do that work with families. We do that work with communities in our our our, um, sorry, businesses and nonprofits in our community as well. All right, I like to stay here because sometimes it's real easy to blame the schools for everything. But there are 24 hours in a day, so let's take a look at a kid's life. They spend seven hours with us, seven hours with us. And during that time, yes, we feed them, we give them exercise, we educate them, we challenge them, they challenge us back. We love on them, they love on us back. And then we send them home and in the community for eight and nine hours. Now we're hoping that all of our children get eight hours of sleep, but that we know that that's not true. We know that some kids don't even have a place to sleep. And even if they did, they're not getting eight hours of sleep. We also know the importance of the other nine hours of family time and community time. And just you know, a week ago, I did my superintendent's breakfast sponsored by the Ed Foundation. Our theme was parents as partners. We can't do our work without parents as partners. And contrary to belief, some rhetoric out there, but not for Lynchburg City Schools, we value the work of our parents, our guardians. And when I say parents, I use that term in parentheses, because if you're a caring adult and that baby lives with you but is not the baby that you birthed, you're the parent. If you're the grandparent, and you're taking care of that kid, you're the parent. If you are the friend, the older brother, the older sister, foster parent, you're the parent to us. If you care enough about a kid, you are that parent. So we like to make sure that we are connecting with our parents, we're connecting with our community partners so that we do this work because our work extends outside of our school doors into the community as well. So let's get into budget. First, 
Disclaimer, you all know that there was a calc tool error in the state budget, one that affected us in the current budget to the tune of about $815,000. It was based on the grocery tax. Um, I, I'm, I'm told that that is fixed, that we will be getting that money. But in next year's budget, it's to the tune of $2 million. And since neither our budget, nor the city budget, nor the state budget is finalized, I always like to lead with this is a factor that may affect our budget. Now, we're hopeful that we'll get it because of um, a lot of things that are going on, but I did want to start with that and just let folks know that we're still working with that. Another piece of our reality, and not just our reality, but the reality across the state, the Commonwealth, um, the nation is the teacher shortage. Um, and our governor is working with us to try to do things to address the teacher shortage. When I look at my principals and my HR director, we have done some amazingly <coughs> creative things to address the teacher shortage. Um, but we are constantly posting for positions. Now, I want you to think about that, particularly in the area of math, when you say, how come those math scores aren't up? And you look at a school, one of our middle schools, that may have had eight math teachers, and now are down to two or four. And those two or four are not only teaching their classes, but they're teaching other classes. They're helping the substitute, who's doing a good job, but still the substitute, teach those classes. Those are the things that we're dealing with, and we want to make sure that we get qualified talent here and keep qualified talent. One of the things that I dealt with this year, and this is new in our business, is the um, wooing of staff members. Uh, with this shortage now, it's just become easy. Just pick up the phone and call a teacher and say, hey, why don't you come to my division and I will pay you X, Y, Z. We used to have a code. We didn't do that. But now we have a crisis because we have a shortage. And everybody wants the best, including us. So we want to keep the best. So in this budget, you'll see our efforts to address our teacher shortage. In addition, we've talked about a living wage. And a living wage, according to the MIT living wage calculator for Lynchburg City Schools, is a little bit over $16 an hour. When we started this work five years ago, I think it was Dr. Gupta who brought us on to the living wage, it was about $11. And now it's up to 16. What we're asking, can we take our lowest paid employees who currently today make $13.11 an hour and we want to bring them up to $15 an hour. And then I listed who are these people. Who are the people who fall on these pay tables? They are your bus drivers, bus aides, auto mechanics, your instructional assistants, custodians, your nutrition workers, your attendance and security clerks, your sec secretaries or administrative assistants. These are the folks who, if we talk about we want our kids to be thriving and surviving, we want our staff to be thriving and surviving. Our school jobs should not be a side hustle. They shouldn't be, that's my part time. And as much as I love shopping at the mall, it really hurts me when I'm shopping at the mall and I see these folks working at the mall because what I do for them is not enough to sustain their families. So we have to do better. You all think we have to do better too. These are a couple of jobs that I pulled off your city website in February. And if we just look at the hourly re rate for some of the positions that you offered, and I picked these specifically because I have people who would be qualified to be a youth worker. I have some wonderful instructional assistants who could do that work. We have maintenance folks who could also do utility line work, technicians. We have those folks. Administrative service assistants. We have excellent, excellent administrative service assistants. And in order to be a um, sanitation operator and drive the um, sanitation truck, you have to have a CDL. We have people who have CDLs. We have people who could do that too. So when we're looking at let's keep our folks and we look at even in the city that you all are faced with the same kind of competition that we are and you're offering positions that are well above $13 and 11 cents an hour. And my understanding is that there, there may even be a proposal to raise that even more and I commend you for that. I think we need to be moving in that direction, but we need to be moving in that direction together as city and schools. There's been some talk about bus drivers and bus drivers, so I just want to really go through what have we done to address the bus drivers in the last couple years. And this data, since I've been here, you can see what the starting rate was in 2018-19 and how it has steadily increased over the last five years and what is proposed 
for next year. So we are not ignoring our bus drivers. We value them. We appreciate them. They have a tough job when they are driving and there's 56 to 70 young people behind them. Um, I know when I drive my car and I have a car full of people how that might be a little bit distracting, but they do an excellent job of getting our kids to and from schools, sports, activities, Saturdays, field trips, all of those things. So this is the work that we want to continue to do and we need your support with that. Salaries. This is our starting teacher salary, 43469 And I'll show you on the next slide how that compares. Um, and I particularly, these are photos of our actual staff. Um, and I wanted to pick staff who are, they're teachers, but they're also, if you look at that, that's CTE. Those are credentialed folks. So we have someone who teaches in our nursing program in a high school. And I asked, well, you know what, you might be able to make more money if you actually go and work for Centra instead of LCS. But the commitment to the children is so strong. And one of the things about each one of these people on the slide is the commitment to children. And as we look at public safety, and as I even think that yesterday was another school shooting, another school shooting, something that I should be thinking about once in a lifetime, not a couple times in a year. No one can tell me that my staff is not on the front line. No one can tell me that they aren't considered to be as important as public safety workers when they are working with our children. So we are proposing that we raise their salary to 50,000. That is a step in the right direction. It is not an end point. It is a step in the right direction to show appreciation for the hard work that they do, to honor their commitment to children, all children. And as Sam Coleman says, we don't have any stupid children in Lynchburg City Schools. What we do have is talented teachers who have a range of keys who know how to unlock talent in children. And when you are that talented that you have an arrangement of keys, and if this key doesn't work, you use the next key and the next key, <coughs> The least we can do is pay you so that you can support your own family as you're supporting Lynchburg City Schools families. So that's in our budget proposal. It's our strategic goal number two. Here's how we compare, just in case somebody said, well, I'm being a little greedy. Um, we have always tried to keep up. But those of you know that keeping up, we can preserve a gap. So if we're behind the counties and we give 5% and they give 5%, guess what? We're still behind the counties. And if we continue that, which is where we've been, we're just gonna continue to be behind the counties. And we're gonna continue to see some of our folks maybe possibly leave to go to the counties or go to different cities where the pay is more. And as things go up, because I'm sure they're going up in your house, they're going up in the homes of teachers. No one is sitting here saying, gas went up for me, but it didn't go up for a teacher or my electric bill went up in my house, but not in the house of a teacher, it did. So we need to really look at these things. Okay, and then when it, we talk about administrators, all right, first let's talk about who is considered administrators. Um, yes, we have our principals and our assistant principals, you consider them to be the administrators of the building, but your speech pathologist, your OT, your physical therapist, your BCBA who is dealing with behavior, um, is also on the administrative pay scale, as well as coordinators and supervisors and directors and our chief financial officer, all of those folks are administrators. And what we're proposing in this budget is a flat dollar increase for admin, and I'm gonna show you what that looks like uh, in a second. So first, when we hear the governor has provided 5%, right, first, that 5% is only for SOQ funded positions, which we're about probably somewhere between 55 and 60%. So what happens to the other people? There's no money provided for them. Does that mean that they don't get a 5% increase? Does that mean that the work that they do, so our elementary assistant principals are not counted in that, does that mean that the work that they do is not valued? Or maybe we only have it for 1.2 positions and we actually have two positions. Who gets the point eight, right? Who gets cheated out of that? We don't operate like that in Lynchburg City Schools. Um, so we do have to figure out a way to value all of our staff.
But that money comes with strings. When we are saying, yeah, here's some money for your compensation supplement, take it if you want, but you also have to add to it. And right now, we don't have the ability to raise taxes or generate revenue or anything as a public school system. Uh, we do what we can to consolidate, repurpose, and I'll talk a little bit about some of the strategies that we use, but we rely on our, our working relationship with you, our city government, to help us in this area. <coughs> okay, so let me just do a little rumor control. So the rumor is they give all the money to the administrators. <laughs> Not true. Not true. And I encourage you, and I think I gave you all um, pay tables so that you could see what we were actually proposing by position, by person, by group. Um, and then I kind of summarized it here. And this is the commitment of this school board. They are really committed to looking at our lower wage employees, right, and making sure, can they take care of their families? And you can see that in our 1550 plan, what those percentages look like for the lower wage employees, the instructional assistants, bus drivers, even our teachers. This board is committed to doing that work. When you get down to the administrators and the chief and deputy superintendent, that does not include me because my contract is negotiated separately. So those of you who think I automatically get something every single year, that is not true. I have to work with the school board to do that. But when you look at that, the percentage is much smaller. Now, I have principals and I have deputy soups and everybody and this whole side in the room. That is not, the percentage is not a measure of their value. The percentage is a measure of this board's commitment to saying that we value all of our staff. But if our principals, if our schools were filled with teachers and our principals didn't have to wake up every morning saying, am I covering the class? How am I gonna do it? That adds value. If we fill our bus driver positions so that we don't have to do two and three runs when somebody's sick, that adds value to it. And this board is committed to putting funds in that area so that we can do those things. And again, you have copies of those pay tables. You can take a look at that. And I say that to say the most important factor in a child's life, what makes the biggest difference, is not the textbook, it's not the Chromebook, it's the people, it's the people. The people who provide instruction, the people who provide support, the people who help address the mental health issues, it is the people, and that's what you're gonna see here. And these people will help our students be successful. Okay, lastly, there are some other things that just go up in our budget, so sometimes when it's Find money, find money, find money. We do find money, we try. But there are also some things that just increase the same way that they increase for the city. Um, and I don't need to go over these in detail. All right, so what have we done? So let's talk a little bit about elementary and just repurposing positions when we have a different need. So some of what you will see is if somebody retires or resigns, we may say, we don't need that position. Let's pull it and do something else with that position. When it comes to our classrooms, particularly at the elementary levels, we do try to fill them all up to that class size ratio. We have moved families who should be going at school X and they may make that class size 28, 29. We've moved them to school Y where the class size was 14, 15, and 16 to try to balance it out to the best of our ability. But some of our buildings are small. Some of our buildings only have two classrooms per grade level. Um, they're not gonna hold 700 kids in those buildings. Uh, we have collapsed classes. We have moved staff from one building to the next where we're like, we don't have as many kindergartners here, but we have more over, over across town. We're gonna move you there. Um, and again, um, collapsing class sizes. We've used technology to help us be more efficient. Um, in our work. We're doing a lot of work with data right now, and we've got a new, thank you guys for a fun balance for last year and helping us get um, Qualtrics, which helps us be better with data so that what the data, what the Qualtrics can do in an hour was taking our people a longer time to do by hand. So just trying to do that. And then reducing our supplies and where we are being, um, where we can find those reductions between one and 3% 
So these are some of the things that we are doing as well as relying on our community partners who do a lot to provide things that we don't necessarily provide for our staff and students. But we need your support in this budget. And as I said, it is the biggest part of our budget is 1550. You've had me stand here before where I've talked a, a lot about a whole bunch of other things. Um, you have a separate handout that also details what else is in this budget. And you will see that there are a few things in here that are just for um, employees because we understand that when the working environment is positive, people tend to stay. They want to be here. Um, and there are some other things in here that are some fixed costs that we think are going up. But if I can speak on behalf of this board, if I had to say what is the one and most important thing in our budget, it is our 1550 plan. That's why we were able to put this on one page and reduce it. And we're here with you tonight to just talk about that and how we can work together to do that. So I'm going to pause. Take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Questions? Mr. Edelson? I, I guess a couple maybe comments more than questions. Um, I know sometimes we ask a question and all of a sudden the, the time is done and we have lots of us here. So a, a comment, when I'm looking at this budget and I'm looking at what is asked for, again, we won't say a declining enrollment, we will say fewer students. How's that? <laughs> With yet again, fewer students and more money being requested locally. As I calculate, that looks like an increase per student of about 16% more than last year. And last year was a pretty large budget in, in terms of dollar amounts. So I also look at the overall how much comes from the state? How much comes from local? We have a composite index. We're somewhere around, what, 33, 36%, which means that the locality should pitch in about 33%. or over 40%. Mm -hmm. The requirement locally, with all the extra matching incentive uh, grants, which includes smaller class size, algebra readiness, all the extra uh, extra benefits that all that require the matching, we have a local contribution that's 29 million that's required. This budget's asking for 47. Mm -hmm. That's almost 20 million more than were required under the standards of quality. And that's per Virginia, which says here's the quality education. Um, when we're looking at these numbers and we're looking at the results that are happening, um, I'm seeing the fact that lots of really, really good teachers have been leaving. And I'm looking at, I think you've had it on your, uh, on your, your board uh, retreat a few weeks ago, or not retreat, but a board meeting, where it showed this high turnover ratio. And I know folks have asked some of the teachers, why did they leave so quickly? Why is it 20, 40, 30, 40% turnover? Lots of it seems to be that it's because of lack of discipline and order in the classroom, when you can throw chairs at teachers and they're not removed from school, when you see these kind of things happening time and time again without having the respect of the students that say, we're not doing that here. If that happens, there's consequences. Lots of great, fantastic kids can't learn because one <clears throat> troublemaker that has got to be removed. And then when uh, the, the troublemaker in some facet, otherwise the rest of the kids can't learn. Also, the, the teachers aren't able to stay. H how can you be a teacher when you're getting furniture thrown at you and profanity and, and things? And uh, I'm hearing lots of things from that that makes it extremely difficult. Those are things that don't cost an extra 20 million bucks. Those are things that require and demand accountability, require respect. Um, and so I hope as we, as we move forward uh, through our budget discussions, we'll actually not just look at the dollars and cents, even though it is a 16% increase is what's being asked compared to just last year in the local contribution per child. 
um, but we'll, we'll really say, what can we really do to have the teachers backs? So they're not leaving. Because what happens in any element, the, the, the better people are the ones with experience, whether you're a fireman, whether you're a police officer, whether you're a city manager, whether you're a councilman, whether you're a school board member, experience matters. Teachers, you've, you've had some experience. Those are people we don't want to be keep on losing. And when I look at those numbers, and I think you guys uh, had heard that a few few weeks ago, those percentage numbers are pretty alarming. And getting to why, I think, is, is pretty critical. And I think the why is a lack of respect and a lack of discipline in the classrooms um, and, and order. So I hope we really address that because we really, we're looking at these numbers in Zillow and we're looking at our great schools ratings. We're at a, a two on average when people are looking at buying property. Those need to increase. And uh, it's not just the money. L let's quit just saying, hey, it's more and more money. Uh, we've seen more and more money and we've seen in my almost 20 years on council, I've seen the local contribution. I've seen the local and state contribution explode, especially with fewer students but I see the results declining, and I recognize it isn't all in the schools. It's societal, as you said, Dr. Coleman. It's, I mean, it's the family unit. Um, but when they're in that class period for eight hours, we need to empower the teachers to say, enough, when there's a troubled kid, the administration needs to have their back and say, he's out, she's out. We're not gonna be having kids worrying about uh, going to the bathroom to be, be beaten up, or teachers, or AIDS worried about being bruised. That, that's got to stop. Any other questions or comments? Mr. Missions? Yeah, I've got some questions. Okay. Um, and I first, uh, I guess I'm required to disclose that my wife is a member of the extraordinary group of teachers we have at Lynchburg City Schools and that I'm able to weigh in on this uh, impartially uh, as it relates to discussing the Lynchburg City Schools budget. Um, can you back up one slide for me? So right there on scenario D, where it shows that spreadsheet, the 11.7 million, if you back out everything in that uh, ask, based on this, I've got it right up in front of me, you're looking at a, at a total of 11.1 million in, in personnel and benefits, yet, <clears throat> In the actual <clears throat> operating fund expenditures, we're looking at 12.1 million. It's about a delta of a million dollars. Can you explain why the budget request that came into the city of Lynchburg and what you're presenting here is off by about a million dollars? So I'm not sure if our initial request, which it was not based on scenario D, when our school board did the, the work of the work that we do with the budget, we actually had four scenarios. Okay. So there was a scenario B, as in boy, there was a scenario B that had an additional $700,000 in it. Um, and at the time that the city manager asked us for a number, we went with that number because the board was still doing the work of the school board. And since then, um, giving uh, the city manager the original number, and I don't know if it has been updated um, in, on your side, um, Mr. Bender, uh, it has come in a little bit lower on scenario D. So I, I'm not sure if that is your question from our original that, to that. that. That answers that question. Um, the next question that I have, um, administration in the budget request, it doesn't look like you're adding any new FTEs to the administration category, correct? No. Can you explain the 781,000 additional personnel services dollars that are being requested over last year? So part of that would be in a salary increase for that flat dollar rate. Part of that is also due to reassigning folks into their correct category. So I can speak specifically for my office, um, Chuck Yarborough, who uh, many of the school boards met as our data uh, analyst. He was in assigned to the technology budget. He has now been assigned to my office, which is not a new person, but it may look like to the untrained eye, wow, that budget just went up, even though we reclassified him to where he 
should be appropriately, even though he was already in the budget in the technology department. So there are things like that when we have to reclassify some folks in there. And then that would also explain the additional 200 and some thousand for the uh, benefits, I'm assuming? The bit, yeah, we have to calculate benefits, and it's more than just health insurance. It's a contribution to VRS and so on and so forth. That is actually explained. I can blow this up. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, you. you can well, see we that can, there's – every see. time we do this, we have to do 7.65% <laughs> for FICA, 3.1% for workman's comp, 16% for VRS, life insurance, and health care. So we're looking at roughly – 110 employees is what you sent in the uh, the list that you sent me with all the all the FTEs on it for city schools. You've got about it shows 109.8 administrative employees for that million dollars essentially. Well, I don't know if the list that you're looking at co correlates to how it has to be reported in the admin categories because if you remember, part of what I showed in admin is the um, the um, BCBA, the speech therapist, but if you're looking at it at a school level, it may look differently, and that was kind of one of the questions that I had asked you about clarity. When so, you yeah, so <clears throat> when you look at the call centers, right, that sheet you gave me, and you've got the major categories, admin, facilities and maintenance, instructional, pupil transport technology, right, those should line up with the operating fund budget request major categories. Is that correct? Let me make sure I'm going to look at no. <laughs> I'm no. Looking at my CFO. Mr. Mistress, this admin category here is based on our admin pay table. So, for example, our principals fall on our admin pay tables. However, under that, in, you know, that line up that you're talking about under function code, they fall under instructional. Not talking about this. I'm talking about the actual request in our budget book, the operating fund expenditures by major category for Lynchburg City Schools that was presented to us in the proposed budget, okay. there's a $1 million increase in administration. Is that in the component 2B1? Let me yes, get. I believe that's what he's referring to. Let me get my document. Are you done at this one? I don't know because I'm looking at it digitally. I'm not looking at it on paper. Page 197 and 198 of the City of Lynchburg FY24 budget. Donna, the two big spreadsheet. Yes. Okay. Yes. This is this is based um, not on our pay scale but on those categories. Major categories. Functions. Yeah. Right. So then. So then. Those should line up with that list of FTEs that I was given. Yes. So that's about 109 FTEs in administration, 109.8, getting that million dollar increase roughly in, in salary and benefits. That that's I didn't count the employees, so I'm going to trust that if you counted how many there were. I just threw it, your your spreadsheet in a pivot table. That's all it is. Okay. Um, now, if you can back up to Remember that slide that you had that had that list of all the employees that said like school-based employees? Yes, sir. Hold on. <clears throat> this one? That one. <clears throat> so if you add those up, which I did since we were sitting here, that comes to 1,640 employees, and I know it says it doesn't include substitute employees. The spreadsheet that you sent me with the FTEs, and I know some of those are partial mm -hmm. because of part-time employees, right? That is 1,441 <coughs> employees. So what I'm confused about is you're showing here that we've got 1,640 employees, full and part-time, active by area. That doesn't even include the substitutes. That's right there on the asterisk on the bottom, does not include substitute employees. That number equals 1,640, but what you sent me in the actual FTE positions for city schools only adds up to a total of about 1,441. Are those the FTEs for the operating budget or the, the FTEs for everything? Is that the FTEs for everything or just the operating budget? <coughs> okay. 
we have to look look and make sure that that does does not include the grant funded positions, school nutrition, which aren't in the operation. They're in here. Okay. There's there's titles in here. Let me back out this filter. Oh. And then we go to search here. Grant. I've got adult education teacher grant, English teacher grant, regional ed grant funded, Title I grant funded, program leader grant funded, supervisor or supervisor grants probably is not one of those people, but it, it looks like there's grant funded employees in that list that you sent me. So I'm wondering, I, 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 I mean, I'm just concerned that we have such a huge delta of 200 employees between what's being demonstrated here when you're asking for this $7 million increase in funding and then the information that was provided to us to consider this budget, that's a lot of money. So like, like I mean, I, I think that it's fair that we know exactly how many people are employed by Lynchburg City Schools, how many positions there are, and how many of those positions are vacant and how many dollars are being appropriated for those vacant positions. Do you think she's trying to hide 200 people? I'm not thinking she's trying to hide 200 people. Oh, I'm not trying to hide I anything. It's just, it's I just not, think no. that it's, like it seems like when you've got information coming from two different sides, you know, this is in the presentation to ask for the budget request. Correct. And then that came from the data dive in the system. That's what came out. So where did that disparity of 200 employees come from? Well, I can tell you, first of all, this information is done at the beginning of our budget because this is what I presented to the school board in February. Your data dive was what, last, last weekend, I believe, is when you asked for that. And I'm not suggesting that that is a delta of 200 because you got me up here without any benefit of looking at numbers and diving in and going one to one. So I'm not even going to try to mm. answer that question yeah. on the spot. But I will definitely look at that because I'm thinking about what's in your spreadsheet specifically <coughs> and do you even have the vacancies that are in there, which would be con counted here as a position that we need. So, um, so well. then, that would, then that would demonstrate potentially if this includes the vacancies, right, just full and part-time active LC employees by area, that there's about 200 vacant positions. Do we have any idea how many vacant positions there are in Lynchburg City Schools? Have that off the top you wouldn't have that off the top of your head vacant position vacant full-time positions not subs or coaches we can get it and, and, and madam mayor i would say that, that we both stated that persons who had questions would would give them to us beforehand and i'm sure the councilman maybe it did but I, I don't want us to get into asking a whole bunch of stuff that we weren't prepared well, I believe that the public who's watching this live, I understand they, that they should hear these questions. And I should say and this too, since we should be since able to get them the answers, not necessarily today, mm -hmm. but we should be oh, able we, to get them those answers. We certainly, I, we are all about transparency, so there is nothing for us to hide. So real talk in what we're doing, even in situations where we have, let's say the number of positions are, and I'm going to stick with math because that's one that we struggle with, six math teachers, but I got four teachers teaching for those six math teachers. So somehow we had to do a little finagling to pay for the extra prep that those teachers yeah. have. So whether or not that can be seen and shown in your actual numbers. So how am I counting that as four people or as six people is what is some of the discrepancy that you might be experiencing because <clears throat> our staff are getting paid to do the extra work for the bodies that are not to their left and to their right Absolutely. in the classroom. In addition to the subs that may also be doing, <clears throat> doing that. So that's just a big question that I've got see the delta between the budget proposal on the second to last slide and personnel services and benefits of about a million dollars between what was asked you answered that with updated information you have I think we'll probably change that in our budget and then <clears throat> getting a handle on um, that number of, of employees I think would be also very helpful and then let me see if I think that there was one other question that I had. Oh, there it was. So 
you guys also sent a student staff ratio document um, spreadsheet and it's is there any do we know why they're so off in the middle schools and the high schools is there is there any particular reason for that is it different programs that are offered or or what is that because it looks like you go from um, Dunbar you've got a 10.6 teacher FT to pupil count ratio and then you go to Linkhorn and that number jumps up to 15.4 which is you know 50 percent increase with 35 more 45 more 55 more students so I'm just wondering why is there such a big disparity in that staff to pupil ratio in the middle schools it's not as drastic in the high schools but I'm just wondering why that is if there's an answer for that yeah part of what we experience and I don't think I have any of my middle school principals here but they will tell you that they felt the brunt of some of that teacher shortage so when you're counting the actual certified people who are doing the job it may be less in certain grade levels or less in certain areas such as reading or English or science or social studies and it is different in different buildings it is slightly different in Dunbar, a school of innovation that also they offer different electives in that school of innovation than in the other two middle schools. And I know Sandusky Middle School also struggled as well with some of that. Got it. Yeah, I think that's it. If anything pops up, I'll ask. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Valdi. Thank you, Dr. Writers, for your, your presentation. I just have some general comments uh, and thoughts as as this was presented. Um, can you go to the slide, if you don't mind, Dr. Edwards, for the uh, pay ranges, pardon me, for different localities and how we relate? Teachers? Yes, yeah, teachers, thank you. So I, I, I'm, I'm looking at this and we are certainly not where we need to be. Uh, I would be bold enough to say, yes, Lynchburg City School teachers' starting salary should be $50,000. I'm behind that. I think we may have a different approach about how to get there, but I, I'm with you. Um, for those who don't know, before my dad got called to ministry, he and my mom were teachers for 15 years each. Uh, my sister teaches in Charlottesville, at a, uh, does theater education, <laughs> makes pennies. Um, so I, I, I know what these folks do day in and day out throughout the summer to make ends meet, and it's, it's not enough. However, um, just from a data standpoint, I, I would imagine we would take the outliers out of this graph, out of this table, out, um, just from a data perspective, not necessarily from a people perspective. From Nelson County, I mean, 50, we're not even close to that, nor anyone else, save for Harrisonburg. And, that's at that point, you're nearly an hour and a half, two hours away, while the demographics may be similar. I think just from a data perspective, we need to be a little bit more realistic in comparison. That being the case, we need to come up with a plan, I think, about how to get teachers to be where they need to be. And um, I, I would also be bold enough to say, I don't believe it's because of lack of funding. I think it's a lack of prioritization. Um, School board, y'all got to be better about investing in, in teachers, making them the priority over stuff. The funds are there. Um, you know, I, I, I hear you. You need more funds to do the things you want to do. So does the city. So do I. I had a big replacement at my house that hurt a lot, <laughs> but I had to do it. Um, so th these are the balances that I'm looking at and saying, okay, so what do you think for all these reaction would be to this request. Uh, bit of a rhetorical question, but I, I, would, I would say I am thankful that the school board doesn't have taxing authority because I, I candidly have very little confidence in the last few years about where these funds are going to prioritize the teacher, prioritize now the, the teacher's aid, the people in the classroom doing the work to make these minds informed and ready for everyday life and instead we're focusing on stuff and things um, i would rather see more targeted approach to to them and in addition to that um no i don't think we should be talking about pulling funding from from the school division 
but how can we get to a place where the 5% for this year is able to be accomplished to get teachers to closer to where they need to be and making those changes happen. I'm sorry if I'm being brutally candid. I hope it's just helpful in saying at least this is where I am. I, I think we need to all be mindful of where the economy is, where our people are, where the tax base is, and where we're looking to go. And so I wanted to offer those sentiments that I'm with you. I, yes, we, we, it blows me away. Uh, forgive me the slide uh, with the, the bus drivers. I, I, I can't imagine what, what they do day in and day out. And in, to imagine in 2018, they were ma making $10.86 an hour. Um, my heart is with you all. My wallet says we need to be more strategic in what we want to be the priority. And for me, it's with the kid, people who touch the kids directly the most. And I'm gonna ask you all, at least from my perspective, um, when you go back to your boardroom, I, I ask for a robust conversation of where can we make some changes to put those funds into the classroom for the teacher. Um, I don't think this was intentional, so I, I want to put that big clarifier out there, but the message we send is incredibly important. Um, one more favor, if you don't mind, the, the, the graph, the second to last slide. On this slide, uh, at the very bottom, it said, uh, thank you, Ooh, almost. You said second to last, this one? Uh, the, whatever this one is, okay. thank you. <laughs> at the very bottom, and again, I don't believe this is intentional, but the message that we're sending, um, you have the last two slides, it's 13 and 14, it's for a math teacher, and I would assume at least one or two uh, English teachers. Yes. Understaff student need. <sighs> Folks, I'm a words person. That is, is 1.9% of the total ask, quote, student need. Now look, I know teachers, that's a student need. I know there are things associated into this that are needs of the student. But let's be real careful about how we're communicating to those at home who are probably teachers and maybe should be grading something, but they're seeing this proposal and saying, wow, this is the only the student need that was identified. Because there are going to be those in this community who say, oh, that's the only student need there. We know that's not the case, but I'm a PR person by heart. I'm a words person by nature. Let's be mindful about how we're communicating this, because I think that just sums up my, my point. Where's our focus should be in the classroom, on the student, and the folks who do it day in and day out. To use Councilman, uh, Councilman Huggleson's term, we should sharpen our pencils and see where those funds are and, and, and what it takes to get those funds to the teachers with the funds that you have right now and then talk about additional funding. Dr. Gupta. I'm gonna take heat off from you and move on to Mr. Banda. <coughs> So Mr. Benda, if you're sitting on a one-legged stool, what will happen to that chair? It has only one leg to it. I know it's a rhetorical question, but you'll be falling down on your face. As a citizen, for me, this community is about education, crime, taxes, and infrastructure. You know, all those need to be in sync. And, uh, and as you develop this budget, I hope you keep that in mind, that. The citizens are asking for a comprehensive um, view of services you provide as a city manager, not just one-legged stool. Yeah. And uh, to respond, I, I think, uh, and thank you for coming to one of the budget and brews. Um, and, and to give you just a quick municipal lesson um, that I think everyone around this table knows and fully understands. Um, as a council manager, form of government, uh, particularly here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, my expectation is to annually, one of my principal duties, and I think I'm actually called in charter, I'm looking at the city attorney, a budget commissioner, which sounds fancy. Um, and so in that, I've proposed a path by which um, <clears throat> this council appears. Um, I've worked with the city departments together with Kith and Ken, which are state uh, officers about expectations in their budgets. I work with uh, Lynchburg City Schools on their needs, what their resources are, because again, like Dr. Edwards, uh, acknowledges no taxing authority. Uh, then subsequent to that, I make sure that I work with each of my seven peers, uh, uh, city council, about what they're hearing from their residents, and I take that together and I try to make 
a fiscal year proposed budget, which I, which I proposed a couple weeks ago. So now that proposed budget, the things that I've heard, that I've reflected upon, that I've talked with many of you, each of you, and more about are in that fiscal 24 budget. And so I have delivered that, and now it is in seven people's uh, uh, in their, they have that now. And they give me their reflection on it, and so we're in a process by which tonight we have a joint meeting. This coming Tuesday we have three public hearings on April 4th, so I ask you to come out, it'll be a blast. And then subsequent to that, we're supposed to have at least three reconciliations where we kind of work through what's been pro proposed. So, I hear you on the tenants, and I'll tell you the seven city council people sitting here support those, which is public safety, infrastructure, economic development, lifelong learning, which envelops uh, education under that, and quality of life. And so the, the things that you put forward, Dr. Groomton, if I miss one, don't let me fall over, but it was uh, taxes, uh, taxes, uh, uh, public safety, uh, education, and I think economic development. <laughs> infrastructure, which includes <coughs> Infra hospitals, you know, and everything else. <coughs> infrastructure, absolutely, absolutely. And no I, potholes, I, you know, the roads should be. Uh... We proposed, uh, and Donna Witt did this a couple weeks ago, um, we have a capital improvement program that's about just north of uh, 500 million, and all that is a maintenance CIP. That, ha that has not taken into account, I think you heard the first presentation this evening about uh, the aged infrastructure that we have at our schools and the, uh, uh, the choices that we have to make going forward about what that looks like. I know that um, Lynchburg City Schools proposed over the next five years $100 million. Um, I'll tell you, I, I would pump the brakes, so I'm putting that into our CIP while we finish this process. So I absolutely hear you on infrastructure. Uh, and I ask you that question during the brew session, so forgive me, but I'm going to ask that for public sure, information. Sure, absolutely. For the Heritage Elementary Gymnasium, you know, we've been asking that, I've been pushing that for years. I don't know for what political or non-political reasons it was set aside or not even ignored, but this year it was on our CIP plan. And somehow the plan which we got now approved by the city, again, Heritage Elementary has been left out. And you had an answer, I don't know. I, I'm sorry that I can't. I would, Donna, I'm calling a friend for help. I can't remember whether that heritage is in there. It's not. Okay. It's because we took out the elementary school within it was, the master plan. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Because I, I get heritage high school and heritage element. So <coughs> elementary. So part of the reason uh, why and what was proposed in, in making a decision about why not to include in the immediate CIP is that you heard both Dr. Wodica and uh, Kent White talk to you about where we are in the process. And it may be. Um, that, and I don't know where it's going to fall. I don't know where heritage is on that. But um, in thinking through where we land on an option, what I don't, what I want to try to avoid is obviously making an investment maybe in a structure that may not be something that we have going forward. So just being prudent that way. And, may, and maybe, and again, I, I don't want to um, put any elementary school for that matter in a place where there's a dire need. We'll make sure that we work with staff to understand what that looks like. But for now, that was just a consideration I made about what had been proposed. And I know that we're going to continue with two, two high schools, three middle schools, and what have you. And so much of what was been proposed there, that was made sure that was a part of it. I'm going to put my neck out. My, see, I, I'm the one who's been pushing for it for about four or five years now. Yes, sir. And every time my frustration was, it's the bad luck of the ward this school falls in. Oh. Ward three, ward four, you know. And it was left out. So that's why I said for reasons beyond uh, anybody's imagination. Hopefully those reasons are now mitigated and uh, we are in a better place. So hopefully they will get, they have a small cafeteria which is used for gymnasium as well as to eat food. I, I hope that, uh, and what I proposed wasn't arbitrary or capricious, but actually uh, a directed, uh, a maybe informed decision as to why. And it was because we're still making decisions about what the complement of 11 elementary schools looks like. And before other investments are made, uh, hopefully we can make those decisions sooner and then figure out where we're headed. Thank you. Hold on one second, Dr. Wilder, if you don't mind. Um, before I, I will lose my train of thought if I don't get this out there. Y'all know, y'all know, it will leave my brain. Um, so one of the things I do have a question about that I did not see, and if, and if, if I didn't see it, is it, was, it was because it was in this slide, and Dr. Coleman and I can't see anything in this slide. <laughs> it's too small. So if it's in there, tell me. Um, it's about safety. So, you know, we did um, just pass the um, 
the uh, return to fund balance for the safety vestibules and the and the repairs to the school. But you know, I'm a safety girl. Public safety is my number one thing I campaigned on, <coughs> and the second thing was schools. And I'm a mama at heart, so I'm looking out for our babies all the way through. And um, the events of yesterday are obviously a devastation. What happened in Nashville? And I have done a ride. I've done ride-alongs with our police officers. I've done ride-alongs with our sheriff's department. I love that our sheriff deputies come by the elementary schools and check in on the babies and make sure that they're safe. They do that at, to, at no cost to, to our schools. They check in and make sure everybody feels safe and secure when they can. And they are understaffed as well. But they do that because we don't have SROs or any, um, anybody standing by uh, safety officers at the schools, at the elementary school levels. Yeah, we do. Uh, yeah, we, we do, do now. We do. we do at all the all the elementary schools. I'm at, I'm at the first one today. Yeah. Okay, so all 11 elementary schools have an SRO now. School safety. SRO, but same type of security guards. Okay, S they do. When did that happen? Yes. So, so we haven't hired. Schools yet. We've, we've been really intentional about making sure we're hiring. Okay. Uh, the right people. Both some, some, some other now, did that come with the grant that we got? Okay. Yay! So that's why it's not on here because it's happening. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well then, wonderful. That's a great answer. My question's been answered. So that's. Um, wonderful to hear. And is that was any were any additions made to um, the middle or high schools? Anything additional done there? Not in terms of adding another SSO or an SRO, because the five secondary schools have SROs in them. Um, but in terms of just our safety protocols, yes, we have been internally working on a lot of things safety, and we've even been partnering with um, I don't see Chief Zudema and community members to add some other safety. So there's a big community group working with Ed Foundation that is help, going to help us pilot some additional safety on infrastructure. Okay. But I digress. The most important, or not the most important, while building envelope safety, windows, bulletproof, all that stuff, SROs, SSOs, the number one safety factor in a child's life, besides their parent, guardian, caring adult, are the teachers and the staff, right? So when I, and, and for us, what we know is that when kids feel comfortable, they feel connected, they have trust in adults, they see something, they say something, we prevent something. And that has been working very well for us. Um, and we love our students who feel comfortable and just tugging on a teacher and saying, hey, this doesn't look right to me. I don't even know what it is. But in terms of prioritizing that, that's what you see here. And going back to what um, Council Member Feraldi asked, Where's the priority? If you look at those percentages, I think we can draw a line where it changes. And this board's priority is really on those folks, and I just I highlighted bus drivers because we tend to have a lot of conversation about bus drivers, but they're not the only ones that are in that, that pay grade um, and instructional assistant. So the people who are closest to the children or in the classroom or directly working, providing those mental health ser services. Your school counselors are included in teachers. I just want you to know that, that that is in there. Your nurses who often notice something are also in there. So that is a high priority resource, the people that the children um, are working with that we can't afford to lose either. Um, there's a lot to be said about relationships, relationships, relationships with children and their families so that we can intervene before bad things happen. And we need, we need more of that. We need, and you, you hear me talking about needing more caring adults in our schools. So we're grateful for the partnership with the police department. We love that the sheriff department is in our schools. Mm -hmm. We're happy to get the grant for SSOs okay. for all of our elementary schools and alternative ed sites. We're excited that a community partner wants to help us envelope our buildings with that bullet resistant glass because we saw how that played out mm -hmm. um, in some of the events. So there is lots of support um, for community mm -hmm. safety. We even met with the police chief to talk about our safety protocols. How do we jointly respond to things when things happen um, in this community? It's not something we like to have to think about, but right. we've got to be prepared for it. Okay, thank you so much. That's a wonderful update. I did not know that, so thank you so much. Dr. Wilder. Yes, thank you for the presentation. It's greatly appreciated. You know, one thing, we look at our, the proposal with a different lens on. 
Uh, we all have different lens. We all have different backgrounds. You know, my background in the education is with my family. My father was a janitor at E.C. Glass. So when I look at that and the, what the custodians make, I'm like, how did he make it on that salary? So I am just have flashbacks during the meeting. But thank you for the presentation. Um, when I look at the proposal, and I look at what some of the, some of the um, the, the focus has been, I see where the focus to me is on teachers. You know, it's, it's one of the highest increases. So I appreciate that. So look at this one of the comments you've heard often. Instead of going to administration, you need to go to teachers and things of that nature, those frontline workers. So I appreciate you addressing that in the budget. I appreciate the 1550 plan where we're really trying to bring those salaries up. You know, for our bus drivers, that's just, it's ch we've seen, we, I get phone calls every day about Paramount Elementary. I don't know what's going on with, about the buses there, but it's like the bus is going to be late because yeah. Paramount bus driver, whatever the case might be. So we get calls every day about that. So I, I'm glad to see some more increase in those areas because it's such a hard need in finding bus drivers. Um, I look at the whole community, and I see it was, I think, 63%, 63.4% of the children are in poverty. So that's just that's scary. You know, we look at our situation, our community, and we see 63 percent of our children are disadvantaged and also in poverty. So when you bring that into the picture, you're bringing so many other issues and so many other conditions, from suspensions, from, from single parent homes, to various other things, to behavior issues, to various other special education, so various other needs that are, that are required in a school system to educate all of our children, regardless of their special needs or regardless of where they come and with all the, where they come from. And also, I look at other piece where the other slide you had, where the kid, you have the kids for seven hours, the children for seven seven hours a day, you know? And in the, um, in the breakfast you had, where you talked about all of us and the parents included, all of us are working together to educate our children. And so the school system has kids for seven hours a day, but they're required to perform miracles in those seven hours. And I, and I even realized, like even today, I had to pick up a kid who was home, who again, because of an A day, he, he oversleeps, so I had to go get him at 12 o'clock to get him to school, where he supposed to have been at 7.30, mm -hmm. and he's a senior. So his mother doesn't drive, so I had to go pick him up and take him to Heritage. So all that community piece is so crucial for all of us working together, doing our part. I could have said, it's too late, forget it. But again, he's a senior. And I realized, even though he may not realize it as much, I realized the importance of all working together. I said, let me go ahead and just take this kid to school. Mm -hmm. So all of us working together, all these challenges, you know, even the, with the teachers, I was on a trip this weekend, and a teacher called me over the weekend and said, your, your foster child, bless his heart, he is a little, he, he needs a one little piece to, so he can have a certain kind of grade. She called over the weekend to make sure he did that before grades would turn in on Monday. So I appreciate the education of the teachers and what they do for every individual kid by name, by need, making sure we address all these conditions of all these children and then still have the effects of COVID. So I, I appreciate the work you're doing. I appreciate you addressing some of the person with those with those salary discrepancies and trying to bring some of the salaries up for the for the, the for the bus drivers and all the other support staff. And also, um, I appreciate the work that we continue to do to try to educate our children the best we can where they receive us, how they come to us, working with pre-K programs and things of that nature. I was at Hudson the other day reading to children, and that's if you haven't done that, I encourage you to go to read to children. If you need some motivation, go to Hutchinson and read to children. It will bring things in such perspective. It, it is so crucial. I encourage everybody to have the experience, and then we can kind of bring it back to focus of why we're here and why we educate our children and why it's so important to make sure at the early stages of why they are, why we make sure we are touching them at those pre-K programs so we can read to them, so they can get those right skills and colors and shapes and sizes that they would know be better prepared for their next grade level. And if not, we're always behind the eight ball trying to educate them on what they should have gotten in pre-K programs or early kindergarten programs. So I appreciate that and making sure that parents understand you know, not blaming parents, but make sure they understand they have a major picture of the part. And those community parents as well, like you said, all of us working together. So thank you for the information. Thank you for the budget. Thank you for breaking down in various ways. So in my lens, I've seen it in various ways that I can appreciate it and understand it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? Dr. Carter? Yes, I was. I just heard about experience matters, and that it is important. You need to have experience for continuity of services, and also for board, um, just for cohesion. So I hope you remember that in May when it's time for the reappointments again, for Dr. Senha and Dr. Brennan. So I hope that comes up, because we really do need that. 
And another thing, every child by name and by need, I have been a uh, former mental health worker, not for children, but for adults, and it moves me. And, and I'm thinking we always want to, it was stated, remove that, but that's a child. And if we're gonna meet every child by name and by need, that means the child that has challenges, the child that may misbehave. And I've even heard a principal state that one child coming to school can change the entire atmosphere of the school. So that child needs some services, not just to be put out, but the child needs some help. And think about it, if you were the parent of that child, you're doing everything you can. And I always say, regardless of where the child is coming from, whether they're coming from the inner city, a suburb, whatever, I don't think any parent gets up in the morning and say, I want you to show off. I want you to act up today. They all send their children out with the expectation that they're gonna do well. They may fall down, they may have some challenges, but that's why we are putting in place different supports like the BCCB and all of those to help those children. So, um, and I don't want anyone to think that every day a child is throwing a chair or a desk or something. That may happen, but I hope it's not every day. The other thing is we have started this an intentional and methodical method to increase teachers' pay since 2017. I remember we were about to vote on the budget and Susan Morrison, a former principal and a teacher, she said, no, we need to take this back. And I was thinking, no, but she was right. And we increased salary starting then and this has been an ongoing process. So this is not something we're just waking up to. We've known this and we're trying to make every effort to do this in every way that we can. So if, Madam Mayor, oh. did you want to respond to that? I, I do because it kind of goes back to what Council Member Helgelson um, spoke about, about just the classroom environment and what happens when you do have children. I, I don't call my babies troublemakers. I say we have children in distress. They're children. Um, and they don't always make the best choices and they don't may not even have the best role models But that's what our education system our social system is there to help our children make better decisions Because if we just send them home and say Go home keep doing what you're doing They're gonna grow up to be adults that do the same thing and we don't want that So what are we doing because you said throwing money at the problem doesn't solve the problem? What do we do for teachers when we do have kids who? You know, they, they, they are doing things that, okay, this requires a suspension or a removal for class. And, and I asked Dr. Brown to come up because we are doing some innovative things that are different to relieve that pressure in the classroom so that learning can continue for all of the children. But we also don't have any child, nobody birthed the child and said this one is the throwaway child. So it is our duty and responsibility to work with children and how do we get them in a position where they can re-engage in the classroom, access learning, and then become that productive citizen. So I just want to give him like two minutes to talk about what happens or some of the things that we're doing with children who are in distress. Thank you, Dr. Edwards. Uh, two minutes is a short amount of time for all the work that we're doing. Um, but it's quite all right. I'll, I'll be as brief as possible. Um, it's it's a, incredibly important to realize how children develop. And we have to look at students from a strengths-based model instead of a deficit model. And so I think one of the major assumptions that is made is that students should know how to behave and know um, what to do and how to act and how to respond. But a lot of the systems and, and supports that they've had in place have been broken down uh, through society and in the community. And so it does fall on educators and, and our systems to try to teach those things for our students. And so we are trying to do some innovative things through the student service department. I have a really hard working team that's been uh, engaging in a lot of different ways. And one of the things that we're most proud of is our restorative suspension center, which we've opened for the high school and are working on for the middle school. So instead of students being suspended and sending them home, not learning any lessons or just kind of hanging out in the community, they go to a center for 10 day suspension or less um, where they were working with our teachers there and our uh, counselors. We have uh, another organization called Life Push that pushes in and mentors these students and helps focus on their goals and uh, works on creating some of those um, structures and, and supports that they need to go back into the base school so hopefully they can learn the lessons and reflect and change those behaviors. Um, our attendance and truancy, that's something that's extremely important. As uh, Councilman Wilder said over there, 
students need to come to school and they need to be in school and that is a, a huge impact and so our attendance supervisor Tracy Peastrack has uh, worked on engaging a program called it engage um, so we are going to have uh, folks at, at no charge to the school division it's a state-sponsored program reaching out and working with families who are truant and families that have students that aren't coming and providing resources and support and tutoring and academic support um, we are also um, working on piloting different programs called restorative academies and all these restore you hear the word restore because we're working off restorative practices and so you know, teaching students that when they are making poor choices, it's not just about um, themselves getting in trouble, but they harm a lot of different people. And they impact a lot of different people with their choices. They impact their peers, they impact themselves, they impact their family members, they impact their teachers, their administrators, the custodians, the bus drivers. There's a lot of people when they make poor choices that are impacted. And so we want to restore those relationships, teach our teachers and our, and our students how to be really intentional with those things and help move us forward uh, as a division. We have a $8.4 million grant that we um, have gotten uh, back in the, in December um, for mental health supports that's allowing us to have contracted services come in but also more social work school social workers who are trained to provide services and intervene for students um, also as well uh, we are able to hire restorative counselors that can work on peer mediation to help students talk through some of those issues respond to self-harm assessments um, address some of the mental health needs that we have um, our, increase our behavior support system, so our BCBA, uh, Board Certified Behavior Analyst, our RBTs, and our behavior coaches. We're able to uh, obtain more of those positions to help uh, systematically improve behavior and how our teachers and school administrators are responding to it. So in two minutes uh, or less, <laughs> we've done a lot of things. Um, again, myself and my team, we've, we've really, we just started here in um, July. And so, you know, we're really excited about that work we're doing, but we do need support. Um, money's not everything, but money is helpful. Um, and when we are, are we're doing as much as we can by looking for grants and innovative ways to shift those FTEs around to provide sustainable systems that are fluid and can meet the ever-changing needs of education, but is also uh, helpful when we are su supported by um, our schools and our community. And I, I think you're right. Like, it's, it's not a teacher shortage. It's a... Um, it's a respect shortage, and so that respect isn't just in the classroom, but it's also in the community. And a lot of teachers that I've personally spoken with and educators that have gotten out of the, 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 um, the profession speak to a larger disrespect in general and just a lack of value for education and the education system. And so as we are trying to move us forward, I think it's really important to think about the overall impact of our words and the importance of how we are respecting everyone in our community um, for all of our positions and showing value and appreciation in those ways. Two minutes. Thank you. I had, um, I have, I know we're wrapping up and I have, I think four people that wanted to ask questions. So I'm gonna do it in this order and we'll try to get finished in time. Um, Vice Mayor Baraldi, go ahead. And then I think Mr. Missions wanted to talk and then I think Dr. Gupta and then um, Councilman Dolan. So let's start with Mr. Baraldi. <clears throat> I, I, there are some who would send me information, comments, uh, have to do a lot of legwork and provide data, who would say that this is nothing more than, than the school board's spin. That's one element of people who talk to me. Then there's the other element of like, hey, I understand what they're saying. It's frustrating, but also let's get down to the nitty gritty and have a practical, pragmatic discussion about finding solutions. And I'm caught in the middle of that sometimes. Uh, responding, if I may, frankly and respectfully to Dr. Carter, I, I hear you in the plans that have been put forward, the considerations, the, the, the direction you've laid out. The direction and plans may be one thing, but is it, is it pushing the needle? Is it changing the, the, the stats? Is it changing the narrative? I contend it's not. I mean, while the numbers can be pulled many different ways that we've all done it, but the facts are since 2019, the administrative budget for Lynchburg City Schools has increased by 45%. The instruction has only increased by five. Now granted, 5% off 70 million is more than, you know, off of seven, and I get that, but again, I want to reiterate, where are our priorities? Nothing drives me nuts more 
than this school board still having pay for themselves. I don't care if you don't take it. I don't care if you don't take the insurance. Still paying yourself. And you're telling me you need $7 million more to pay these folks to get the jobs done. I hear you. I'm with you. Yes, need, change needs to happen. But folks, where are your priorities? And uh, I don't want uh, Dr. Coleman, it has been said by council on many fronts. It is a new day in Lynchburg. It is a new council. I hear you. I'm being as respectful as I can be in saying I just don't get where the board is going. And Mr. Vice Mayor, I respect everything you said until I say that, but I do want us also understand that with an elected school board, you're generating another $180,000 worth of potential expense. Because if school board members didn't get paid, I don't see why that's okay, but this discussion about a stipend is so, so horrible. You do realize that that's gonna be more money away from students with what is being pushed. And so, Dr. W. Coleman, I may have my perspectives on it. I got you. Board. I'm with you. I'm not here to talk about that. I'm here to talk <clears throat> about the budget. I hear you, sir. The say. numbers are what the numbers are. I contend the priorities are not where they need to be with the dollars you have. And I, have and I pull that full, full force on the Lynch for City School Board. Okay, Mr. Mitchins. And this actually might end up being more of a question for Mr. Friedman. Um, I guess the first part of the question is, is there any, is there any push in this budget to expand any pre-K access? Is that something more you're working on? We did not include any additional pre-K three or four-year classes in this budget because our focus was on the 1550 for the current staff. So, so a question that I have, and this is probably the part that's for you, is when you look at the charter on the powers enumerated to city council, it says that city council is to designate the age of pupils to be admitted into public schools and the grade of such schools. So looking at this just from an accountability perspective, historically, when you guys have expanded these programs, have you actually come to city council and made that request? Do we know? We actually get funding from the state for our pre-K programs through VPI. So part of that is coming in that direction. So but with the charter saying that that is up to us, is that something we would have to approve for them to do? I'm just curious. I'd have to, I'd have to have that in front of me and look at it, Councilman Ms. Jensen. It's just not something I can speak to right now. Yeah, it's just, it's just a question that I have for accountability because that's really what it's going to come down to here is we need to start reining in the school board and the school system to produce results for families and for students, and, and that's what it comes down to. Dr. Gupta? I want Mayor Dolan to go, and I'll go after you. Oh. So I just had a quick question, and I'm sorry I didn't get his name for the gentleman when he was speaking about the challenges with young folks. I just wondered what role the Empowerment Academy plays in that program that he's... Yeah, that's part of it. We do have students, a small population of students more at the high school level that attend the Empowerment Academy. Um, and those students aren't necessarily suspended from school. Right. Um, some of them are doing credit recovery. Some of them have issues with school phobia, small groups, and some other um, things. But what we're trying to do and what Dr. Brown said is we really want to get our students armed and, and sort of in a position where they can access the base school curriculum, rather than having a lifetime of either I'm in and out for suspension or I'm permanently in alternative ed or worse, mm -hmm. I'm in detention leading to other places. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay our last question will come from Dr. Gupta. I have a comment and a, and, and a question for you. You know, we, we can easily throw bricks at Dr. Edwards and saying you're lousy, get your bags packed and you're gone from here. My observation with her is, She's powerful, she's thoughtful, and she and I don't agree on 80% of the stuff, but she's very respectful. Uh, she will listen to me, and we may disagree, but end of the day, she'll tell me her logic of why she's doing it. So having said that, Dr. Edwards, would you share with this public, you took this district over in the 2016. Mm, 2018. 2018. Mm -hmm. What have you done so far? I've been sitting, sleeping on the wheel, and... <laughs> Let, let the car go to the wreck? Could you blow your horn a little bit? Blow my horn? Oh, that is not an area that I do. Well, one of the first things that when you all hired me, you were under an OCR, um, voluntary OCR agreement. And 
it was really important to take a look at that and what were those issues of equity access. Um, so I originally spent a lot of time on working on how do we expand programming, how do we get more kids involved, what are the issues, and we were successful. Uh, you hired me April of 2018 and August of 2019, we were out of OCR compliance. So that was one of the things um, that we, we started looking at. Then we were expanding some of our programming to make sure that we have more gifted. Um, it's not just about remedial education, but really about access. And when you have high expectations for kids, they will start to live up to your expectations. They will also live down to your lower expectations. So some of the work that we have done is with programming in terms of making sure that we have more opportunities in all of our schools for our kids. Salaries was a big thing. I think the pay tables have been frozen when I started. And you know, the first thing I heard was we haven't had a raise in 12 years. <laughs> um, and you don't appreciate us. So we started working, we reinstated pay tables and we have over the last couple years managed to give an increase every single year, even though the budget uh, has not necessarily increased, which is a, a testament to how we're tightening our belt. Um, we've done pre-K programs because we do believe in the value of early childhood. The research suggests that um, we've upped the rigor in our pre-K program. We have a tight curriculum. There's a class observation that goes along with it. So our pre-K program is not babysitting. So it's not just a place. There's real learning going on. Um, we've added measures. When I first got here, the only measure of student performance was um, the SOL test scores, and they don't, they don't measure apples to apples, so you have no ability to look at cohorts. You could say last year third grade did this, this year fourth grade did that, but it's not a cohort. So we instituted some IXL um, so that we could look at children and growth, and are they moving the needle? Because there's a difference between proficiency and growth, and having been a science teacher, having taught AP chemistry, I can tell you some of my kids on first day of school could pass the test without any instruction <coughs> from me. It's not a reflection of how good I am. It's just a reflection of what knowledge they brought into the classroom. And I could leave them there. But as an educator, I'm responsible for growing my students. So it's not good enough just to say how many have passed, how many have grown. And that's the focus that we have taken um, looking at the division. Last, then we had the pandemic, so let's just take those two years. I know sometimes we pretend like we didn't have a pandemic, but I'm not pretending like we didn't have a pandemic. We had a pandemic and schools were thrown in the middle of, you are now an expert on healthcare, mass, no mass, put them together, small class sizes, no small classes. There were a lot of decisions for which there was no playbook that said, you graduated from Seton Hall University. Here's the playbook for when the pandemic happens, what you should do. So we had to make a lot of decisions on that. Fortunately, we are on the other side of that. Now we're in the world of workforce development. So we have an and beyond plan. We brought people into our schools and said, take a look at our juniors and seniors. It's not good enough just to have a C average and graduate. That's not a life plan. What can you do to make sure that when they walk across that stage, yes, they're going to graduate, but are they going to succeed? So we've changed our focus on that. Partnered with CVCC, University of Lynchburg, invited Randolph College, VUL, all kinds of community partners to come in and engage with our schools because sometimes the near peer, I think is the word that we have for, for the young college, the successful college students, that's the best mentor than myself. We've done a lot of work with that and we continue to focus. Now, as far as accreditation is concerned, um, we went from, if I'm re recalling, like two schools to five schools right before the pandemic. We were at 13 schools out of our 16 that were fully accredited. And I'm a, that, I am going to toot my horn on that one. <laughs> 13 schools. Then we had a pandemic. And I really want to look at how much has completely 100% recovered from the pandemic. Because the kids who went through the pandemic, they also brought their experiences back to school with them. The ones who were starving during the pandemic came back that way. That is the work that we are doing. It is a marathon and we continue to do those things. And we will continue to provide excellent programs, continue to get more kids in the, we increased the, what is that, the um, Gov School. We started a partnership. We got kids in the CTE Academy. So things have been done. So for anybody sitting here saying, I've seen nothing done, I suggest 
open your eyes. And then if you're really not sure, come to the schools, talk to the kids and teachers about what's going on in the programs. So when you get on the helm, we were only two schools accredited. What you're telling us five. Now, five. Exactly. now we got 13 schools accredited. We had 13. Now we're down to eight because of the pandemic, but we're working our way back up and recovering. How about the athletics? Are we shining there or going in the trash can? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, um, as we are, another phrase that's coming out, commit to connect. We want all of our kids to connect to something in our schools. So our athletic program, and many of you at City Council have celebrated with us and joined us in recognizing our track team, our basketball team, our football team. There's more to come. There's our Skills USA students. There's our forensics team. Theater, if you want a great night out, we have excellent theater programs. Our middle school Dunbar program went to Atlanta and is winning awards. And our kids are really doing it in athletics, arts, and extracurricular, which is also something we know that when kids feel a sense of belongingness and they feel like they matter, they do better. Thank you. Well, thank you very much to everyone. We appreciate everyone from the school board and our fellow council members. Dr. Edwards, thank you for your presentation. Um, with that, we are recessed until 7.30 where city council will reconvene in city hall and council chambers.